everybody. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to the training, learning, and development community. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad Anya's here, <laughs> running a little bit late, but I'm really, really excited to talk about this one. This one we had to reschedule a couple of times just to, due to some conflicts, but um, Anya is going to be talking about what philosophy can teach us about learning, which I'm excited about because recently it feels like I've been having lots of conversations with people about intersections into learning and development. Right. I mean, like yesterday I had a, uh, a showcase with uh, Vicky, Victoria Gerstorfer, and she was talking about how um, she was going to be a therapist at some point, And then she ended up becoming an L&D professional and that therapy is kind of, you know, that therapy is her background. And that's that's really um, had a, a profound effect on what she does as an L&D pro. And so now we're talking to somebody who has a really, really diverse background. Anya and um, and philosophy is just one of the things that she is 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 skilled or has knowledge about. And I would love I can't wait to hear what she has to say about how that um, what that philosophy can teach us about learning. Um, but before we get going, let me give a shout out real quick to some of the folks that are in JC, Jason and Margie and Kim, Don, Christiana, Jr. Pleasure Meditation. Welcome, Melissa. Gabby, Nadia, there's lots of people in chat. So feel free to um, keep posting in chat. If you guys have any questions, I'll, I'll bring them up to, um, to Anya. Also want to remind you guys, AIDC 21 is next week. I've got over 500 people already registered for that event. Anya was one of my primary sources of inspiration for even producing that thing. She's um, going to be on a panel for next week. It's the Accessible and Inclusive Design Conference. It's free, so go to AIDC21.com if you um, are interested in signing up for, for that event. I think it's going to be a really, really good one. And with that, Anya, I'm just going to hand the mic over to you and um, um, would love to start out with just hearing about your background in philosophy and, um, and why we're going to be talking about this. Cool. So I apologize for being late. Um, it was not my plan. Um, so how did I get into philosophy? Well, I actually uh, read my first philosophy book probably around age 10, 12 or 13. And it really um, got my juices flowing, so to speak. I don't know, um, I probably was a nerd from an early age and these big questions that philosophers have asked through the ages just absolutely fascinated me. Uh, <clears throat> I went on to study philosophy and psychology in undergrad and then went to graduate school for political philosophy and later on organizational theory. And Philosophy has really enabled me to uh, expose myself to a, all, a whole bunch of new areas and understand them fairly quickly. Because what philosophy teaches us is, is first of all, how to think properly. And uh, by that, I mean how... what how should we think about things uh, in order to understand them? What types of things should we be looking for to gather knowledge? What is knowledge? How do we make sure that what we're being told is true or that what we're being taught is true versus not true? What counts as evidence? What things um, make for good evidence and not so good evidence. And also, how do we analyze and dissect things, particularly very large and complex topics? So I, I call it the, um, I, let me call it intellectual hygiene part of philosophy that I think has been extremely useful for me in my career even as a non-academic, even as someone who doesn't teach philosophy. So what I want to do today uh, to, is talk with you about two major, shall we say, systems in philosophy that have influenced education and learning theory throughout the ages. 
And uh, I want to talk about it in fairly broad strokes because I don't have a whole lot of time and I also don't want to bore you guys to death. But, um, uh, and I want to leave some question, <laughs> leave room for questions because, um, you know, this is, this is really good stuff, but it's also pretty, uh, pretty deep and complex. So I'm going to tell you about two guys. Yes, there are guys <laughs> um, in Western philosophy that I think have shaped the thinking about education and learning. But first, we need to take a look at philosophy in general. And um, I'll give you a brief overview of the, air, the big areas that philosophy generally touches upon. And when you encounter a philosopher's system of thought, it's good to figure out first and foremost what their answers are to these big areas or these big questions. So the first area is called metaphysics, and that's really the question of what is the nature of reality? Um, <clears throat> historically speaking, there are, and I am um, admittedly somewhat simplifying here, two approaches to this question. One is there's only one reality, and that is usually considered to be nature. Uh, and the other approach to it is that there's more than one reality. There is this world, there's nature or the world we exist in, and then there is something above that, something supernatural, so to speak. The second question pertains to knowledge. It's, it's the area of epistemology, and that is the study of knowledge and the, the study of how we acquire and use knowledge and gain truths. And there are, again, <clears throat> broadly speaking, two approaches to this, uh, or two areas, I should say, that uh, factor into this. One is, our human capacities for sense, perception, and reason. And, you know, the, the folks on the realism side, the folks on the side that say there's really only one reality, will strongly defer to, the, to these two things, um, our reason, our senses. That's how we uh, learn things. That's how we acquire knowledge. That's how we hopefully find truth. Um, on the side of the folks who tend toward um, uh, saying there are at least two realities and there's some sort of supernatural reality, although I will put a caveat on here that it's not always the case, typically they will also say there is some sort of mystic faculty. There is what religious folks might call faith or what Kant, Immanuel Kant, a German philosopher has called pure reason. And those things are independent of really reality. They often, the thing that you get, the knowledge that you derive through, through some mystic force or faith or pure reason isn't dependent on observation uh, per se. It somehow comes to you, it may be, uh, only appear to you when you reach a certain state. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, again, this is very much painting it with a broad brush. Obviously, there are you, you know people on both sides, the supernatural side and the naturalism side, um, aren't exclusively on one uh, one um, uh, way of ac accumulating knowledge versus the other. The third area is what I would call human nature. Uh, also, um, you know, closely related that, to that is ethics. So this is where things get a little bit more complex. There are those who say that human nature in and of itself is sort of neutral or as Locke would have called it, um, John Locke that is, would have called it, tabula rasa. So they're not inherent. So we're not inherently bad. We're not inherently good. We're, we're just 
we. <laughs> and then, um, you know, life, life shapes um, how we turn out. Uh, and um, there's also, there's, there are also folks in philosophy who might actually lean toward the goodness side of things that inherently human nature is pretty good. On the other side, and this is something that you find in a lot of uh, supernatural traditions, there is what I might call dualism. That is, we there are two realities and typically our reality, this world, nature, is bad. Um, I think if you look at the Judeo-Christian tradition, you will find this a lot. The body is the source of sin, for instance. And then the higher realm, so to speak, and that's where the dualism comes in, that's where the goodness lies. Um, and then uh, lastly, uh, we would look at how all these things play out when it comes to things like uh, social and political systems. And there are a variety that's, uh, that come out of these different schools of thought. But um, I will say that the school of realism is... Uh, often considered to be largely responsible for the emergence of democracy and um, liberal, uh, liberal um, political systems. Whereas uh, the, the uh, school of supernaturalism or what um, really should be called idealism uh, tends to produce more authoritarian systems. Again, that is not true across the board, but um, when you look at the history of philosophy, you can see those tendencies. Now, what does it mean for learning and education? Um, there are really, two, um, I would say, two approaches to learning, training, and education, historically speaking. One is more of a top-down authoritarian approach. And that's the idea that the learner, they really need a lot of help and they need a lot of direction. On their own, there isn't much going on there and they may even stumble in the wrong directions. So the teacher, or educator or trainer is the one who has the authority, who directs learning, and who actively encourages or discourages uh, what should be learned. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand is a strong tendency toward individual choice. So the learner is primarily self-motivated. They want to learn, they want to discover things, they are curious. And they, and it's really that internal motivation, perhaps sometimes coupled with extrinsic motivation, that leads to the formation of knowledge and um, um, true states. So, <clears throat> when we look at the history uh, of philosophy in general, but also at history in general. I think you can probably make a pretty fair guess um, where, for instance, the idealists or the supernaturalists fall. And we have seen that throughout history, what were the primary institutions of education, historically speaking? It was the church. And before the Reformation, what happened, what was, um, and this was also one of the impetus, uh, one of the impetus for reformation was the fact that the church essentially had an, a monopoly on education, a monopoly on, um, uh, on, on, on teaching. And uh, they often you would used um, authoritarian, uh, authoritarian figures like the priests, the Pope, etc., to establish what truth is. And, well, 
we know how that usually ended. <laughs> but um, you know, if you remember perhaps from your history classes, one of the complaints of the Reformationists was the fact that you've had priests teaching in Latin or holding their services in Latin and the peasants didn't understand that. So they just had to rely on the interpretations of the, um, of the clergy. Um, also, education was very segmented and genderized, right? So there were certain things that were allowed to be learned by women and by men, and that's just kind of the way it was. Learned women, women of knowledge, women who studied philosophy or politics or arts or whatever were fairly rare, and they were typically... Um, uh, in the in the in the higher class right uh, in the you might call it leisure class or um, noble class or whatever um <clears throat> now the on the realist side um it the move toward a more individual choice paradigm um, at least in the Western world, came <clears throat> after the Middle Ages in the Renaissance, uh, through the Renaissance, and then one of the big folks um, you should probably want to know about if you ever study philosophy education, a philosophy of education is um, John Locke in the British Enlightenment. And and these people were were saying, "Look, um, it's not just uh, you know this this authoritarian approach to teaching and learning isn't isn't good, and we need to um, move toward a more liberalized system." But John Locke was also someone who reacted to the predominant view. Uh, of the day, which was more this idealist view, the view that there's a duality to human nature, that um, uh, humans are inherently bad, that um, they need to be explicitly taught and directed, that the learner is passive rather than active. He very much um, responded to that in developing his philosophical system. Uh, and one, one phrase that you may have encountered when it comes to John Locke is this phrase that I mentioned earlier, tabula rasa. And the idea of tabula rasa is really that in opposition to this view that human nature is inherently evil or bad, that the body is a source of sin, that if we're not shepherded and directed uh, in appropriate ways, we are going to wreak havoc. Human nature is tabula rasa. It's a blank slate. And it is up to the learner primarily to sort of fill that slate. I want to uh, preface this, uh, the, uh, the next thing by saying that obviously now we know that the human nature and the human mind in particular aren't really a blank slate. We know uh, a lot of things now through neuroscience, through um, uh, neuropsychology, through biology. Those things obviously weren't available to John Locke at the time. So, uh, and Steven Pinker uh, wrote a great book about um, this, this um, a mistaken idea of tabula rasa that I would highly recommend um, to you if you're, if you're interested. But, um, you know, building on maybe very rudimentary structures that exist in the human brain, uh, it is the learner's motivation and uh, the learner's choice to pay attention to certain things versus others that drives learning. Uh, and that that drives um, knowledge discovery. So 
Locke was pretty adamant, um, for instance, when it comes to child education, that there is a lot of uh, choice left to the individual and that they are allowed to experiment, that they're allowed to experience things on their own and learn from those experiences. And um, he was not a big fan of things, for instance, uh, such as, um, let's call it uh, the stick, you know, that is punishment. And, you know, those days, corporal punishment, for instance, was still pretty widespread. And um, so he, he didn't think that was very useful. Um, <clears throat> so the i kind of jumped over the um the the sort of main representative uh, rep representative of the idealists but um uh to go back to that i would say and this might be controversial or at least up for debate the main figure there i would uh, would um say is plato an ancient philosopher probably one of the most, if not the most famous and influential Greek philosophers. And um, while Plato uh, obviously wasn't a Christian or really what you might consider a religious person, he did posit this idea of two realms, of two realities. And uh, that was uh, something that actually the Judeo-Christian tradition continued and there are some famous Christian philosophers that lean heavily on Plato, although some of them also um, take from Aristotle who was Plato's student and who was in opposition to Plato, a staunch realist. What's very fascinating about Plato is in my, uh, in my view, um, the, the way he thought about learning and knowledge um, acquisition. And actually, I think it was kind of good that I talked about this tabula rasa idea before, because um, it might make Plato's uh, epistemology a little bit more easy to digest. So we talked about this idea of two realms, and Plato uh, essentially thought that human nature was uh, and and really also what human beings would turn out to be in terms of uh, their professions, for instance, was fairly determined at birth. And this came from this supernatural um, or, you know, primary realm, so to speak, uh, that um, is the true source of reality, the true source of knowledge, the true source of truth. And our re reality, you know, what's happening right now is really just a bad copy of a copy. And what we do when we learn rather than you know, is discovering and experiencing things and building knowledge in this sort of um, uh, scaffolding nature, we actually remember. Uh, we uh, remember the true forms of things, the true uh, nature of things. They're sort of passively revealed to us in a way. Um, this is really the theme of Plato's allegory of the cave. So, um, and I kind of mentioned how this might play out if we're, if we're talking about, okay, what is a person gonna grow up to be? And Plato in his politics, um, and that's actually um, the name of one of his most um, influential works, talks about that. You know, there is, you know, the people are going to become the soldiers, the people are going to be, uh, become the politicians and leaders, the people are going to be the whatever um, uh, laborers, for instance. And if that reminds you of uh, Eastern philosophy or the um, Indian caste system, 
Um, that's a pretty good connection you're making there. Anyway, um, there isn't much room really for the person to really become anything that they want. And so education and knowledge is has to be directed from sort of authoritarian source. Um, so that's in juxtaposition to, to Locke and this idea of tabula rasa or what we might call more now um, cognitivism perhaps, um, <clears throat> where we're talking about self-discovery, uh, by, by that I mean the self-discovers, <laughs> um, and experimentation and learning through um, your own intrinsic motivation. So what does that mean for teaching and learning and for training? Um, and I kind of want to throw this open to you and to make some connections and discussions or in the questions that you're gonna ask. I think that you can probably see both of these systems reflected in corporate education, uh, in higher education, in K through 12 education, uh, and in professional training. Um, which of course doesn't mean that someone who prefers a top-down teaching or training approach is necessarily a philosophical idealist or for that matter, even uh, you know, a religious person, for instance, um, or that they don't believe in liberal or democratic values. Um, so I, I wanna make sure that that's not misunderstood. What I'm saying is that these uh, philosophical systems that have influenced society um, for thousands of years, um, that's how they've shaped thinking down the line about derivatives like education and learning um, and training, if that makes sense. Most of us probably are not aware of those philosophical roots though. So um, as, as trainers, uh, and I'm specifically using the term trainer because that's, um, I know uh, obviously there's learning and development and some folks uh, like to call them, uh, you know, like to go by that term when they describe what they do or instructional design. Thinking about where we're, where we're placing the learner and we're replacing the source of the learning, be that another person, like a teacher, a trainer, an instructor, as well as the actual sources of information that we're using. Um, that obviously has an, an effect on the outcome of learning. And while in my personal opinion, through my experience, having taught philosophy, having taught political science to undergraduate students, having tutored uh, middle schoolers, having trained professionals in a bunch of different areas, uh, I think that what tends to work is somewhat of a mix of both. Although I think that the broadly speaking, more liberal take, the John Locke take, say for instance, um, particularly with adult learners, I think um, tends to bear more fruit. Now, this is a very <laughs> um, a rough um, portrayal of my own views and I could go more into detail but I just kind of wanted to throw the initial scaffolding um, of the underpinnings of philosophy in, in learning and education out there. Uh, if you're an instructional designer, um, you may have come in contact with some 
theories and um, systems of um, education or philo philosophical systems of education, um, there would be, for instance, behaviorism. Behaviorism would fall on the realism spectrum and perhaps extreme realism spectrum. There's cognitivism, uh, which also would fall primarily on the realism spectrum. There is constructivism, and that is, I would say, probably more on the realist spectrum um, <clears throat> than the idealist spectrum. And um, let me just quickly look through my notes. Um, you know, so these, and then we have pragmatism, for instance, that would be one name you might recognize, John Dewey. And we also have, and this might be more in um, uh, might be more visible in K through 12 education and uh, perhaps even higher education, there's existentialism. Um, so these relatively new theories of education or philosophical systems of education uh, tended to be built more from a realist um, perspective. Um, but, uh, you know, the idealist spectrum um, definitely, I think, still exists uh, and um, uh, can be seen in, in other approaches to education. Boy, I talked for like 30 minutes now and um, I just want to get some feedback because I feel like I vomited a lot of knowledge on you guys. Wow, that's a lot of information on you. Pretty, it's really compelling and provocative. I um, there was a lot. There were a lot of things running through my head. Of course, I had like another browser tab open where I was just like flying through. You know, um, you know what was it? Was it Daniel? Da no, Stephen Pinker and, mm -hmm. and looking up realism and just sort of tracking everything down. But you know, thanks for sharing that. I'm wondering, like, the impact that philosophy has on, say, the kinds of curriculums that you build. Like, are there any sort of practical sort of applications that philosophy has been able to um, to contribute to the, the way you do your work? And then the other thing for the audience, I don't know, um, for those that don't know you, you um, have a lot of focus on, on data analytics now. Yeah. So, um, so I find that really kind of intellectually compelling, just all of these different influences into um, who you are as an l and professional. But, um, but anyway, some just philosophy and the way that you actually build your curriculum. Do you have any, 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 anything to say about that? Well, uh, <clears throat> you know, let me put it this way. I'm not a fan of Plato. I, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, my favorite philosopher still to this day is Aristotle, mm -hmm. who was a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant person who not only thought about philosophy, but also expanded that into the realm of sciences, uh, which would be mathematics, biology, physics. Um, and um, some of you may know also that he uh, was a tutor to Alexander the Great. So he certainly got involved in, in real life there. Um, and the realist strand really runs very deep with me. Um, I don't think that the human mind is quite like uh, John Locke described, although I, you know, I do give him a break because a lot of the science knowledge just wasn't there. Um, I mean, the evolution uh, theory of evolution still had to be discovered, uh, for instance. Um, uh, I can tell you some very interesting tales about what people thought, how certain things worked. It's always quite amusing. But um, uh, I think that um, later philosophy that's really sort of started, uh, been, that's really benefited from what we started to learn about um, the human uh, human body, um, the human brain, also psychology, 
and so on, and neuroscience in particular, has enabled us from a philosophical standpoint to um, build more full-fledged answers around how knowledge gets formed, how we get to truth, and what counts as evidence, you know, those epistemological questions. And that always influences me when I build training because um, I know that I am in front of adults and most adults are not very gullible. Well, maybe I shouldn't say that. I don't know. Sometimes National Enquirer. But anyway, um, you know, and people are also very internally motivated. I see this in adult learners all the time. If they don't care about what you're trying to teach them, it's not learning isn't going to happen. And so that very much influences me. And I have to figure out as a trainer, how can I lock into something that is that switches that switch in them, that makes them make a connection, that makes them figure out, oh, this is how this is relevant to me and what I am doing. And this is how this fits into the overall picture that I already have in my head. Mm -hmm. um, I look at knowledge formation really as sort of an intricate web that gets weaved over time. You know, you see all these um, different concepts and you knit them together through various um, connections. And that's, that's how I often kind of think about it in my mind. Um, but we also know very much that environmental factors play a role in learning. As an autistic person, I know that sensory um, impacts really affect me when I'm trying to learn something. If it's too loud, if it's too bright, if it's too hot or too cold, or if I'm wearing an itchy sweater or something like that. Um, or, you know, you just had a lot of stress at work. You know, there's a bunch of demands being placed on you and that's gonna interfere with your ability to learn. So, you know, this is in very broad strokes how um, I think uh, philosophy and what I've learned building on, on the philosophical concepts that I've learned um, has influenced me in, in in teaching and training. Yeah. What I found really interesting was kind of the historical perspective too, you know, just, um, um, just taking that into just sort of the contextually, how all of that um, has, has affected how we teach, how we train and, and all of that. Now, one thing I'm wondering is, is about the sort of the critical thinking piece mm. um, and, and philosophy um how does that kind of apply to to all of it like um you know when you're building training and you're having to consider who your learners are like um does that does that fit into it at all like they're a, a person's capacity for critical thinking and being able to um i don't know consider what what is what they are learning does, does that have any impact at all on um, like philosophically? Is there any historical context for that or? Yeah. People. So um, I, I mentioned epistemology and I should have probably also mentioned as an offshoot of that is logic and logic mm -hmm. is traditionally uh, usually taught in philosophy. Um, if you're an undergraduate major, for instance, and um, as a matter of fact, my good friend Aristotle um, was probably um, one of the most influential figures in developing um, logic. And um, while logic is not everything when it comes to critical thinking, it does provide um, very strong and important underpinnings. And that's just, are you building an argument that, is, that makes logical sense or that's valid? Mm -hmm. Or is the argument that you're being um, approached with, um, you know, logically valid? And so um, 
I personally, and this is maybe me stepping on a sand, sandbox, I don't think logic should be uh, left to higher education. It should be taught in in uh, in school, and I mean in elementary or middle school to begin with, um, because it is so so critical for um, intellectual hygiene and for building good thinking processes. Um, as 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 a child, um, but we also have to remember that kids don't have fully formed reason, right? So we kind of have to adapt it to that. Um, so I think that um, critical thinking. I mean, it means it, it's a gosh. And this term is sort of also just thrown around so much. It's been kind of watered down, and you know. It, it's kind of difficult sometimes to really figure out what someone means by that. Mm -hmm. But really, for me, it's always meant, um, do your arguments make sense? Um, are they logically valid? Uh, are you using proper evidence? Um, are you using data? And that doesn't just mean numbers, right? I mean, data is more than numbers. Yeah. And um, most importantly, um, are you claiming um, knowledge properly? You know, do you have sufficient information to claim knowledge or that something is true? Mm -hmm. um, unsurprisingly, more often than not, we should say, I don't know. Right. No, that's a really, really good point. Yeah, even for me with an English undergrad, it, it's, more, um, it's more about um, process, I think, for myself. Um, you know, at least that's what, <laughs> that's what I, when I went to school, that's what we learned um, studying English lit, um, more about um, processing and, 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 and developing a mode of critical thinking. Well, gosh, Anya, this has been so great. I could go so abstract on a lot of this stuff. I have like so many more questions, but, um, but, uh, but um, we've run out of time. Thank you for doing this. I know we've had to stick with it a couple of times to be able to get this one on the books. And um, I really appreciate you being able to share with us. Um, and if anybody has any questions, I didn't see anything pop up in chat or in the ask a question area, but I know we were talking about some pretty heady stuff. And um, um, and Anya, I look forward to any more conversations that you want to have on on with TLDC. If you have anything else that you want to that that you want to talk about, please hit me up. And then of course, we'll see you next week. Um, you're going to be on the panel on Friday mm -hmm. and I'm really, really looking forward to that. But um, yeah, thanks for your time today. No problem. Thank you for having me. And um, if you guys have any more specific interests um, for me to explore with you, uh, maybe some specific schools of thought on education, um, I'm, I'm more than happy to talk about that. Um, I think behaviorism, for instance, it's extremely interesting, albeit extremely wrong. But, <laughs> um, you know, there's some very interesting folks um, we could talk about when it comes to, to education and learning. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. All right. All right. I'm going to go ahead and close it out. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Don't forget AIDC21. Um, go to AIDC21.com if you want to register for the free event. We have over 500 people registered. Um, hopefully it doesn't over it doesn't hit capacity so we can get everybody mm -hmm. in. But I'm um, really looking forward to that next week. All right. Thanks, everybody. Oh, I forgot. We actually have um, a, a broadcast tomorrow, too. If you guys want to show up 8 o'clock um, Friday, uh, we're talking with, um, oh, gosh, it was the Unite Lab from um from florida state university i think it is um yeah join us tomorrow we're going to be talking about accessibility and inclusion as well so um yeah hopefully we'll see you there All right thanks everybody